Hello Team FD and welcome back to another XI where today we're going to be looking at a team of legends overshadowed by their teammates. Let's go. Goalkeeper Gregory Coupe Fabian Barthez may have the World Cup winner's medal, but Gregory Coupe was arguably the better keeper. The Frenchman earned just 34 caps for his country, thanks to Barthez and later Hugo Lloris, with the former selected over him as France's number one for the 2006 World Cup. This was despite Coupe playing six out of France's 10 qualifying matches and earning 69% in a public vote on who should be the team's default stopper. If he'd played, perhaps Le Bleu could have won the tournament, with Barthez failing to stop a single penalty in the final shootout loss to Italy. At that point, Coupe was one of the form keepers in Europe, coming off the back of five consecutive domestic titles with Lyon, a run which would eventually stretch to seven in a row. The Ligue and Keeper of the Year four times in that period, Coupe conceded 216 goals in 262 matches. And across his whole career, he'd keep clean sheets in 36% of his games, only just behind the record set by modern greats like Iker Casillas and Oliver Kahn. Thanks to a medial ligament injury, his late career saw a steep decline, and he couldn't achieve further success with Atletico Madrid or PSG. But when called upon by club and country, Coupe was among the safest hands in the game. He simply deserved more. Right back, Christian Panucci. Maldini, Baresi, Nesta and Zambrotta are all well known, but Christian Panucci's place in the roster of great Italian defenders is often forgotten. The right back began his career at Genoa before moving on to Milan under Fabio Capello, and by the age of 23, he had six trophies to his name, including the Champions League and two Scudetti. In the three full seasons he played at the San Siro, Milan had the tightest defence twice, allowing 81 goals in 102 games. And when Capello moved to Real Madrid, he took Panucci with him. That 1997 switch made Panucci the first Italian to play for Los Blancos. And though turmoil behind the scenes saw the club run through five coaches in Panucci's three years in Spain, he still won another title and a Champions League. Sadly, between 26 and 28, the defender's career saw little success, with spells at Inter, Chelsea and Monaco all failing to match his quality with silverware. But as Panucci's pace diminished, his brilliant game reading allowed him to flourish at centre-back. And in 2001, he'd arrive at Roma, where he'd go on to make over 300 appearances. At the ripe old age of 34, Panucci made the European Sports Media's Team of the Year in his new position. And he even added goals to his game, netting eight in all competitions that same campaign. He retired in 2010, a veteran of over 700 games for club and country. Defender Alder Generally seen as a nation of showboating, tricky attackers, Brazil's track record in producing intelligent, dogged defensive stars is often overlooked. For every Romario, a Dunga. For every Neymar, a Fernandinho. And while Cafu and Roberto Carlos made their names by marauding forward from their defensive posts in the late 90s, they were allowed to do so by the watchful presence of Alder, one of the country's finest ever centre-backs. Equally happy crushing into challenges or spraying long balls upfield, Alder was a Selassau regular from 24 until 35, earning 80 caps. In that time, he won one World Cup and reached the final of another, won two Copa Americas and came second in a third, also representing his nation at the Olympics. At club level, he played in Brazil, Italy, Portugal and San Marino, with his greatest success at Roma, where he spent 13 years, making 436 appearances, the fifth most in their history. The perfect club servant, he turned down the captaincy in 1998, arguing it should go to then 22-year-old Francesco Totti. And three years later, he helped the Giallo Rossi to just their third Scudetto ever. When he left, Roma retired his number six shirt, only returning it to service when Alder gave his blessing to Kevin Strootman a decade later. Defender Riccardo Carvalho Carvalho's first trophy came in 1999, his last came in 2016. There's no better way to sum up the consistency of the Portuguese's career at the top level, which saw him win seven titles across three different countries, with Jose Mourinho coaching him to silverware at Porto, Chelsea and Real Madrid. Named the best defender in Europe in 2004, a year he won the Premier League and the Champions League, Carvalho made a £25 million switch to Stamford Bridge, where he completed a run of four consecutive domestic triumphs. In his first three years in London, Chelsea conceded 61 goals in 114 games, with Carvalho's impeccable game-reading making up for his lack of pace. 
He fell out of favour after Mourinho's departure, but won the Prem again with Carlo Ancelotti, before re-teaming with the special one in Spain, where he started over Sergio Ramos at centre-back alongside international teammate Pepe. His two trophies at the Bernabeu would be his last at club level, but Carvalho still had more to give, bringing his tally of 89 international caps as part of Portugal's glorious Euro 2016 squad. A final payday in China capped an outstanding career for one of the most underrated defenders of the modern era. Defender Adri van Tigelen Read any account of the Netherlands' glorious Euro 88 campaign and you'll come across Marco van Basten, Ruud Hullet and maybe Frank Rijkaard. But just as vital to the country's one international success was left-back Adri van Tigelen, who only broke into the squad at 26 but would go on to earn 56 caps and turn out for the Orangi until he was 35. Left-back Van Tigelen, then at Anderlecht, played every minute of the Euros as the Dutch conceded just three goals in their five games, building on his domestic success with Anderlecht, where he won two titles, helped break a 12-year drought in the Cup and reach successive quarter-finals of the European Cup. Van Tigelen was nicknamed the Spiesche, meaning the nail, and returned to his homeland from Belgium in 1991, joining up with PSV Eindhoven, then managed by Bobby Robson and spearheaded by Romario. PSV lost just once all year, conceding 24 goals in 34 games to finish three points clear of Ajax, and Van Tigelen would continue to play in the top flight until the age of 38, before going on to manage his first club, Sparta Rotterdam, to promotion from the second tier in 2006. Midfield, Franz Roth there's just 18 players in Bayern Munich's Hall of Fame, and while you'd have heard of most of them, the name Franz Roth is probably not familiar. A midfielder whose commitment to tough tackling saw his teammates wear shin pads even in training matches, Roth broke into the Bayern side at 20 and ended his first campaign with the Rotten by scoring the winning goal in the European Cup Winners' Cup final against Rangers. That was the German side's first international trophy, and Roth, nicknamed the Bull, would end up with 12 pieces of silverware in 12 years in Bavaria, while continuing his habit of scoring huge goals. He started all three of Bayern's European Cup finals between 1974 and 1976, netting the winner in two of those. And his shooting wasn't only a menace to his opponents, with one effort breaking the net in a game against Rapid Vienna, the other destroying the stadium clock at Bayern's ground. With 322 appearances in the shirt, Roth was only knocked out of the club's top 10 appearance makers in 2019 by Thomas Muller, and his tally of 72 goals still ranks him among the 20 top goalscorers in Bayern's history. He now runs sporting goods shops in his hometown. Midfielder Johan Nieskens Perhaps not the greatest Johan to ever wear the orange shirt of the Netherlands, Johan Nieskens was still a top-class player in his own right, and his career took a similar path to that of his teammate Cruyff taking in spells at Ajax, Barcelona, in the USA, and a return to the Netherlands. The midfielder, whose skill in every phase of the game saw him described by teammates as worth two men in midfield, broke into the Ajax side at 19, and in four seasons in Amsterdam, he was instrumental in transferring Ajax's domestic cess to the continental game. The Dutch team won three consecutive European Cups, with Nieskens providing for Cruyff and overall, he earned 10 trophies before the age of 23, when he switched to the Camp Nou to re-team with coach Rhinus Michels. A fan favourite, nicknamed Johan II for obvious reasons, Nieskin actually beat Cruyff to La Liga's award for best foreign player in 1976, and excelled for the national team as they reached successive World Cup finals, netting five goals at the 1974 edition to win the silver boot, ending up with 17 in his 49 caps from the centre of the park. His later career would see him play alongside Franz Beckenbauer for the New York Cosmos, but his last medal came at 28, with stints at Groningen and in Switzerland, adding to his bank balance, but not his trophy cabinet. Midfield, Robert Perez While Arsene Wenger came to be regarded as a dinosaur in his later years, his early time at Arsenal saw plenty of innovation. As well as off-the-field tweaks to diet and training, Wenger converted midfielder Laurent into a right-back and used Robert Perez as an inverted winger, stationing the Frenchman on the left where he could cut inside to shoot and create. It was hugely successful. The wide man, who chose the gunners ahead of Real Madrid and Juventus in 2000, played 198 times in the Premier League, won 115 of those games and contributed to 103 goals. Not bad for a man who cost just £6 million. He also netted 14 goals in the Champions League. Not a huge tally, but the same number as Zidane, the Brazilian Ronaldo and David Villa. 
And of course, he also won the World Cup, Euro 2000 and two Premier League titles, scoring and assisting 24 in 28 games in the first and going invincible in the second, as well as helping Arsenal to a Champions League final for the first and only time in their history. In his twilight years, he would go on to the quarters of the same competition with Villarreal. And though a spell with Aston Villa would only show a shadow of the superstar Pires once was, he remains an Arsenal and Premier League legend, and one of the very best wingers to play in the division. Forward, Sir Tom Finney. When a footballer's name is preceded by Sir, you know he was good. But though Tom Finney was acclaimed in his time, his brilliance is often forgotten, thanks to England's World Cup win three years after his retirement. However, the wide man earned more caps than Gordon Banks and Paul Scholes and scored as many international goals as Alan Shearer, despite only making his debut for the three Lions at 24 as a consequence of the Second World War. Finney fought for the Allies in Egypt during the war and did his patriotic duty on the field as well, winning an incredible 51 of his 76 games for country. At club level, he was no less impressive, scoring 187 goals in 433 games from the wing for Preston North End. At first, the nation's post-war situation saw him combine his football career with a side hustle as a plumber, but soon his fame was international, with Palermo attempting to make him the world's best-paid player in 1952. But Finney chose to remain with Preston, despite the side spending two years in the second division. And while he ended his career without a trophy to his name, his one club man's status made him an icon in his hometown. Knighted in 1998 for his services to the sports, Finney died in 2014. A statue of him still stands outside of Preston's ground, a monument to the club's greatest son. Forward, Ulf Kirsten. At 5 for 8 and 81 kilograms, Ulf Kirsten was built less like a footballer than a missile, a fitting comparison for a player who started his career during the Cold War playing on the wrong side of the Berlin Wall. Then prohibited from appearing in the Bundesliga by his East German status, Kirsten netted one in three for Dynamo Dresden, won two titles and racked up 49 caps for his nation by the age of 25, when the country was finally reunified. But he wasn't just a footballer during that period, secretly working as a spy for the Stasi, the East German State Police, as the organisation sought to prevent stars defecting to the West. But after the wall came down, Kirsten's past was quickly forgotten. Snapped up by Bayer Leverkusen, he would go on to net double figures in 11 of his 12 full campaigns in the Bundesliga, finishing as top scorer in three separate seasons and bagging 181 goals in 350 matches. Along the way, he helped the team to the Champions League final, but only won the DFB Pokal, finishing second in the Bundesliga four times. He was also drafted into the new and combined Germany side, making 51 appearances to become the first man to earn 100 caps while playing for two different national teams. Kirsten retired in 2003, having played for just two clubs. Forward, Florian Albert. Ask someone to name three Hungarian footballers, and they'll likely mention Puskas, Kosius, and then probably run out. But Florian Albert is the only Hungarian ever to win the Ballon d'Or, beating out Charlton, George Best, Eusebio and Beckenbauer in 1967 after scoring 28 goals in 27 matches in the domestic league and winning a third title with Ferenc Chavos. That may sound like a relatively weak CV, but Albert put in outstanding showings at the 1966 World Cup and European Cup, finishing joint top scorer at the latter alongside Eusebio. This was all the more impressive given that he wasn't an out-and-out -out striker, playing more like a number 10 who could create and dictate tempo as well as get on the score sheet. And get on the score sheet he did. A decent record of 31 in 75 for his country was dwarfed by his club performance, with 255 strikes in 351 matches for Ferenc Varos, the only team whose shirt Albert ever wore. That included five campaigns of over 20 league goals and 11 successive seasons in which he hit over double figures, finishing as top scorer in three of those. On the continental stage, his glittering performances bought Ferenc Varos glory at the 1965 Intercities Fairs Cup, then a prestigious tournament as the Budapest side disposed of Manchester United and Juventus. His son, Florian Jr., would also appear for Ferenc Varos and Hungary, and the one-club man received the ultimate honour in 2007 when the Green Eagles renamed their stadium after him. So guys, that was our 11 legends that were overshadowed by their teammates. Who have you missed out? Should we do a part two? Let us know in the comments below. Like, subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.